I'm in Matthew chapter 13. And the Lord Jesus Christ just got done with the parable of the sower. You know, speaking of the stony ground, the thorny ground, and the good ground. And you get down to verse 10. And the disciples are asking him, you know, why are you speaking in parables? So let's look at verse 10 through 17. It says in verse 10, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? They're asking the Lord this question. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you, the disciples, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them... It is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. So let's talk about how you can begin to understand the greatness of Scripture. You know, there's a lot of people that the Word of God is not precious to them. But you understand the greatness of the Scriptures, how great they actually are. The greatest thing in the whole world. And I'm going to tell you my journey of understanding is how great the scriptures are. So looking at verse 10. The first thing I did when I got saved. I didn't know much about the scriptures. I didn't know much about the word of God. I didn't know much about all that seed that had been sown in my heart. So the first thing I did was asked questions you want to understand just how far this scripture goes you need to ask questions you know anytime you want to know something you want to learn something go further along you start asking questions i'm constantly training a new person at work and when i get somebody that starts asking questions i'm thinking this person's going to get somewhere when you get somebody that doesn't ask any questions you're thinking, this guy has no interest in doing this job. So when you first get saved, or even beyond that, you want to ask questions. There's always going to be questions. Question shows an interest. Question shows that you're trying to learn. Question shows that you're even studying. So you ask questions. Look at what the disciples did. Verse 10, And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? You know, he, they're wondering, Why did he tell them this parable? Why didn't he just tell them the thing just outright with just get straight to the point? So they're asking this question. And that's what you want to do. You want to ask the author. You know, you have a book. This is the only book that the author goes with you everywhere that you go. If you're saved, you're carrying the author with you everywhere that you go. You've got Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can ask the author. And in Daniel 2.22, it says, He knoweth the deep and secret things. There's nothing that you can ask him that he's not going to know the answer to. And you know, uh, back there, King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, he had great people coming from a long way to ask him, hard questions and you know what in matthew 12 42 jesus is called calls himself greater than solomon he said a greater than solomon in here is here 
<laughs> you know, another reason why it's good to ask questions is because it shows humility. It shows you're not proud. When you can ask somebody a question, you're saying, I don't know everything. It, it shows a lot about a person who's going to ask a question. It shows a lot about you to the Lord when you ask Him a question. It takes humility. I mean, you get, you get your holes filled by asking questions. You know, you, you, maybe you got something down pretty good in the Bible, but there's always those little bitty holes that need filled. And once you get that further understanding, that hole's filled, and you can move on to the next thing. And then that's got little holes that need to be filled. You get your questions answered, and you can move on to the next thing. Asking questions, it, it helps you perfect that which is lacking in your faith. You know, he said to the Thessalonians to perfect. He talked about perfecting that which is lacking in their faith. And, you know, preachers, teachers, pastors. Ephesians 4.12 says, They are for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, you ask the Lord a question. You're showing humility. You're showing him you want the truth. And he can send you somebody to answer that question. He can show you the answer in the Word of God itself. You know, imagine a question and answer session with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's what the disciples had here. A question and answer session. Imagine the opportunity. But the thing is, you do have the opportunity. Every day, you got the Word of God. Ask the Lord a question. And he can show you the truth out of the Scriptures. Search the scriptures daily. Verse 11 says, Now here's the Lord's answer. They asked the question, here's his answer. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. You see, some are going to have understanding, some are not going to have understanding. And it all goes back to, Will you believe? The more you believe, the more you're going to understand. The less you believe, the less you're going to understand. It was given unto the disciples to know the mysteries, but not to all these other people. So it was like the parables would further along the understanding of the disciples once he explains it to them. But for all the non-believers out there, it concealed the truth from them. And the Bible's like that too. If you believe the Bible and you want to learn the Bible, you're a saved Bible believer, God will open the Scriptures to you. If you want to reject the Bible and not be a Bible believer, God will conceal the truth from you. So the Lord wants to reveal things to the humble, to the sincere, to the believing heart, but like the disciples were, but to the proud and the exalted and the critical heart, they're just going to stay blind. Let's look at a few verses to go along with that. Luke 10, 21. In Luke 10, in verse 21, it says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. You see, there's some things that are hid from the wise and prudent. There's things that are hid from these know-it-alls, these proud, these exalted, critical hearts, and they're going to stay blind. But he reveals them to the believing heart, the common man that is not trying to be puffed up, not, not trying to be proud, just wants to know the truth. So he reveals it to them. And if you want to understand and realize how great the Scripture is, you need to ask questions. And then another thing, like I said, you need to believe what you see and what you hear when it comes to the Scriptures. You know, when, when Jesus spoke, the disciples believed what they heard. They saw Him do miracles, and they believed what they saw. They weren't trying to say, well, this is sorcery. This is, He's, he's doing, He's uh, casting out devils through Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. No, no, no. The disciples didn't say that. That's what the Pharisees said. They were attributing his miracles to the devil. They didn't believe what they heard. They didn't believe what they saw. And he says in Matthew 13, 12, For whosoever hath, 
to him shall be given. You see, the disciples had a believing heart. They had truth, and they're going to get even more truth. So it says, and he shall have more abundance. The disciples believed him when they first saw him, first heard him, and they just kept getting more and more truth. Even all the way up till the, the three, that inner circle, sees Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah. They see all these great things, these miracles. Peter walking on water. The Lord walking on water. He shall have more abundance. It's like the more you believe and the more you accept what God shows you, the more you get. And that is, I've seen that over and over and over again in my Christian life. It's like it never stops. The more that I'll accept and receive and take from the Lord, the more he's going to show me. And the more he just keeps flooding me with truth. It's like getting, it's like a flood that he gives me of truth. And you just take it and accept it and don't doubt it. He says, he shall have more abundance. You want more truth? Then take more truth. Accepting it, believing it, not doubting it. So, but it says, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. And that's the Pharisees. The disciples, they were given more abundance. But people like the Pharisees or Sadducees or just, you know, any non-believer out there, he took away from them even that which they had. You know, the Jews had a lot of things. But all that was nothing without belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at Romans 9, 3 through 5, it gives you an uh, overview of what the Jews had as Jews. Paul said in Romans 9, 3 through 5, he said, For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. That was the Jews who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption. So they had that, the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, Christ came. See, he came down of the seed of David according to the flesh. He came down of the tribe of Judah, a Jew. It says, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. But none of that even matters. If they're not going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they're not going to believe he is who he says he is. So, whosoever hath not, if they don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. They lose any advantage they had as being a Jew when they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, over in Romans, uh, he also says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Well, they had the oracles of God. We got the scripture from them. But if they don't believe it, what good is it? So you want to believe what you see and hear. You got to. to if you're going to understand the greatness of scripture and realize how great it is, you're going to have to believe what you see and hear. The disciples have all that and more because they accepted John. They accepted the preaching of John. They accepted the preaching of Jesus and his word. And look at what Peter and John go on to see. Look at the book of Revelation and all that that John, the apostle John, went on to see. Look at what Peter went on to see and do all through the book of Acts and wrote, in his, own, wrote his own epistles even. The more you accept what God says, the more abundance you'll get. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. You know, back when I got saved, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about the Bible version issue. I remember uh, I had a New King James Version that I just had before I was saved. And, you know, at the, the, the church I was attending, they had all types of different Bibles. I didn't know nothing about the Bible version issue, but maybe a week or two after I got saved, I was in. I was shown 
the Bible version issue, and I was shown that the that the King James was the right Bible. And at this time, I didn't know the difference between. I, I thought that the King James and the Authorized Version were two different Bibles. I remember thinking that, but I found the truth that those the modern versions are not what I need. I, I needed the King James, and I accepted that truth. And uh, I, I was led to the right people that showed me that the Bible doesn't have have errors in it. And I've I've not struggled with doubt in the Bible. I've I've never struggled with doubt in the Bible since I was saved. I just take it for what it says and leave it at that. And that's the best thing you can do. Why waste time with people who are constantly trying to get you to doubt the Scriptures? It's like when I talk to people and talk to people around or at work or just anywhere. They're constantly trying to get me to doubt the King James Bible, doubt the Scriptures. And, I, and I, all I tell them is, all I'm going to tell you is, I don't know have all the answers, but I've got a Bible in my lap, and it's 100% right, and you can go to it and get the Word of God 100%. I said, what is wrong with that teaching? And they said, well, the King James has got errors in it. And I said, what spirit is telling you to tell me that? You're telling somebody who has 100% faith in the Word of God that it has errors in it. What does that remind you of? Well, it reminds me of Genesis 3. And in Genesis 3, what does the devil say? Yea, hath God said. Hath God said, you shall not surely die to Eve. So the first thing he wants to, to get her to do is doubt the Word of God. Well, that's what she does. And that's what these guys want me to do. They want me to doubt the Word of God. And they want to show me errors in it to get me to not believe what I see and hear. But I just want faith in the Scriptures. But anyway, I believed in the in the King James Bible shortly after getting saved. I got saved hearing a man, uh, when I heard a man named Denny Castle preach on hell, I believed the gospel, I got saved, and I learned all kinds of truth from him. I wanted more truth, and the Lord led me to Peter Ruckman, I got a lot more truth from him. The Lord led me to Hoffman, I got a lot more truth from him, and then Lord led me to my pastor that I currently have now, Donnie Dalton. I got truth from him. I got truth. I, I said, I want even more truth. Send me somebody else to give me something else that I don't have. The Lord led me to Bob Alexander. I got all kinds of truth from him. I wanted somebody, I wanted him to send me somebody else to give me more truth. And I, somebody introduced me to Art Martin and Nathan Bemis. You know, you just, even now I'm praying, you know, send me somebody else that's going to even lead me further along the way. And you say, well, you just, you, uh, you put too much, too much, um, uh, emphasis on men. Well, no, back there in Ephesians 4.12, it says for that, that God gives these men for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And I'm not saying any of those men gave me more truth than the other. But that was the progression that I went on. Like, I got different things from each men that helped me grow along the way. That was just the order that they happened to be in. But you know what? You can believe what you see and hear. Because Jesus Christ himself is called a faithful witness. Revelation 1.5. He's faithful. He's a faithful witness. And what he says, you can believe it. And he's faithful.
You know, Peter got to see and hear many things. He saw many miracles. He saw many things happen. And you know what he said in his epistles? He said, now we got a more sure word of prophecy. That's the scriptures. He believed the scriptures was even more sure than what he saw with his own two eyes. His belief of what he saw and heard led to better things. It led to a more sure word of prophecy. He would have never got the more sure word of prophecy if he didn't believe what he saw and heard. And, you know, I've talked to people, they say, well, don't you think that those Old Testament stories and those stories in the Gospels are a bit embellished? He looked at me and with a serious look on his face and said, don't you think those, I think I was talking about Samson, you know, killing a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass or tying 300 fo the tails of those foxes together. And he said, don't you think that's a bit embellished? I heard Bill O'Reilly say, and I don't watch the news, I just heard him say on a clip, he said uh, that the Old Testament, it's, it's good moral stories, or it's, it's good stories, but it, they didn't actually happen. And he, he, I don't care how smart he is, he, he done lost it. You got to believe what you read in the scripture. You know how they say you can't believe everything you read? Well, you can in the Bible. You can believe what you see and hear. And that's how you begin to understand the greatness of scripture. You begin, you begin to realize how great it is, you just keep believing it. You know, I didn't see God do the creation. I didn't see him throw the stars out there. I didn't see him put up the sun and the moon. But he made in me a new creature. I've not seen him heal people. Like, like he healed the man with leprosy. Like he healed the blind man, the dumb man. I've not seen any of that, but I've, I've seen answered prayers. I've not seen the creator face to face, but I've seen his creation. And you can't deny him when you see his creation. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. So you want to ask questions, you want to believe what you see and hear. You want to look for explanations. You know, uh, when I come to something in the Bible I don't understand, I don't doubt. I don't think that the Bible is wrong. I just look for the explanation. And if I can't find the explanation, I'm cool with that. Yet somebody, A lot of people come to me with these so-called errors in the King James Bible, and I don't know all the explanations to them. I can look for an explanation, but if I, I don't find one right away, or if I never find one, I don't doubt it. I, I don't doubt the scriptures. I just believe that there is an explanation, and I just go on about my day, and I just go on reading the Bible and studying the Bible and believing the Bible. When you find something you don't understand, don't doubt the scriptures. Just look for an explanation in the scriptures themselves, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2.13, you know, Compare spiritual things to spiritual. Isaiah 28, 9 through 10. You go here a little and there a little. You you find the explanation. And if you don't, uh, don't doubt it. You see, all these non-believers out there, those Pharisees, those Sadducees, and all kinds of them, you know, he came into his own, his own received him not. They didn't believe. So he says in verse 13 of chapter 13, you know, and watch out for the thirteens. He says, therefore speak out of them in parables, because they seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And they don't look for an explanation, they just doubt. They don't want to believe. They want to be in the dark on it. So you look for an explanation. Even if you can't find the answer, don't doubt, only believe. You see, Jesus is without spot. First Peter 1 Peter 1.9, he's a lamb without blemish and without spot. And you know what? Romans 11.33 says, 
How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Now, if Jesus is the living word and the Bible is the written word and Jesus is the word, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. If, if the living word is perfect and his ways are past finding out, wouldn't it make sense that the written word is perfect and its ways past finding out? There's going to be things in there that you don't have an explanation. You can't find an explanation. You can't find all the answers. You don't understand it completely. You can look for the explanation, but even if you don't find it, oh well. We know that the Bible is right. We believe what we see and hear. We can ask questions, but maybe the author is not wanting to give you that answer. Maybe there's some things in the Bible that he's going to reveal later on. You know, like back there in Daniel, he said, you know, seal up these things. Remember? He wasn't, he wasn't ready to give that out. You know, he when Paul got caught up to the third heaven, he wasn't ready for Paul to tell everybody what he saw. You know, you can look for an explanation. You might not find one. But most times, when I'm looking for an answer, I'm looking for an explanation, I, I find it. The Lord will show it to me. More times than not. In Isaiah 16, Israel couldn't see, hear, or understand. They had blinded themselves through their, through their idolatry. So, in Matthew thirteen fourteen, it says, "And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, that's Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear, and shall not understand; and seeing you shall see, and shall not per perceive." The, that prophecy of Isaiah, that's Isaiah six nine through ten. And they can't. You know, back there, Israel was all involved with idol worship, idolatry. And they became just like their gods. And then, this people here, just like that, they can't see, and they can't hear, and they can't understand. They became like their, father, like their fathers who were idolaters. Back there in Psalm... 115, 4 through 8. Look, look at this. It says in Psalm 115, 4 through 8, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They Now look at this. They that make them are likened to them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. Then it says, O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You see that? They became like their idols. And then these Pharisees, these Sadducees, these unbelieving Jews, they became like their father's idols. And they are of their father, the devil. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Let's look at this. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The God of this world blinded their minds to the truth. They didn't believe what they saw. They didn't believe what they heard. They didn't look for an explanation. Nothing. They didn't want to believe it. Over in uh, John... 844, the Lord says, You are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. They didn't want to have their abode in the truth. It says, Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And he says in verse 45, And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. They didn't believe. They didn't want to believe. They couldn't understand because they didn't have the Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned.
That's why you don't. They didn't understand the scriptures. They did not have the spirit. You got to have the Holy Spirit to understand the scriptures, and to understand how great the scriptures are. So, verse four, verse fifteen. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. You see, no matter how crazy it sounds, just believe. They see it with their own two eyes. They saw it with their own two eyes. But since they're spiritually blind, they didn't accept what they saw with their own two eyes. They heard with their own two ears. But since they were spiritually blind, they didn't understand. Just, you know, Nicodemus, one of them that ended up believing, you know, in John 3, 3 through 12, he couldn't understand that concept about being born again. But he, he just kept on believing anyway, even though he didn't get it yet. And that's the way you got to be. When you approach something you don't see or you don't understand, just keep on believing anyway, and you'll get it. Now, verse 15. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, and lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. So the next thing you want to realize the greatness of Scripture. You want to be a Bible believer. You need to have a soft heart towards the Scriptures. These people's heart was waxed gross. That means it's it grown fat. Their heart was fat. They, in the sense that, you know, the truth, it couldn't penetrate it. It's too many layers, too many layers of unbelief to penetrate their heart. It grown, it waxed gross. It grew fat. It couldn't be pricked. You know, over there in Acts 2, it says, you know, the preaching of Peter, it pricked them in their, in their heart. You can't prick the Pharisee's heart because it's fat. It's grown fat. So many thick layers of unbelief. <coughs> you know, some people will believe anything except the Bible. They'll believe all kinds of stuff. Evolution, the Big Bang. You know, that we're just living, none of this is real. We're just, we're living in a simulation, they say. They won't endure sound doctrine because their dull ears are itchy. First Timothy 4, 3, they don't want to believe the sound doctrine. They'll believe anything but that. They, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes have they closed. You know, over there, uh, Jonathan got a little bit of that honey and his eyes were enlightened. Just get you a little bit of honey, the Word of God's compared to honey, and your eyes will be enlightened. You believe it, and then you believe a little bit more. You would believe a little bit more, and you're going to eventually see. And it's all going to come together. And you're going to see what you've been missing all this time. Just believe. So he says, lest at any time they should see with their eyes hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. You know, the parables were to give illustration to teach those who wanted to hear the hear and know the truth. But to the blind uh, and those that reject the truth by their hard heart, uh, it, it, it was, the, the parables was to conceal the truth. So, it's like Jesus Christ, you know, he's the stone of stumbling. He's the rock of offense. To those who were, who believed on Jesus Christ, he's the rock of protection. But to those who reject Jesus Christ, he's the stone that's going to grind them to powder. And that's where the word of God is. That's where these parables were. The word of God will make you or it'll break you. The parables could give illustration to you and really nail that truth into your heart. Or it could blind you even further. You know, you, 
You get in the Word of God and you believe it, it'll be the best thing that's ever happened to you. You get into the Word of God and don't believe it, and don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God will allow the Word of God itself to damn you to hell. You, uh, you get into one of these false religions and you don't believe the Scriptures, God will allow you to use the Bible to further damn you to hell. I mean, you, you can find verses to prove anything. But along the way of finding verses to prove anything, you got to reject a bunch of verses. So you need to have a soft heart towards the Scriptures. You know, many times Jesus, like in Mark one forty one, He would look on people with compassion. And, you know, God had to look on people with compassion to come down in the flesh and die on the cross. Why can't you look on Him with compassion? Like, why can't you have a soft heart towards Scripture? Why is it that the moment you hear anything, the moment you hear sound doctrine, the moment you hear the Scriptures, you automatically become critical and negative, and you have a hard heart towards the Scripture? Why not show Him the same compassion and soft heart that He showed you? In Mark one forty one, He looked on a man with compassion, a man with leprosy. If Jesus, who is perfect and without spot, can look on a man that's got leprosy, full of spots, and have compassion? Why can't you look on the Holy Scriptures with compassion? You know, and it says, and he says, in verse 15, he said, lest at any time, now he's talking about those unbelievers here, who the parables, the parables conceal the truth to them, he says, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. You know, he's using the parables to get them further along down the road of unbelief. You know, after a long time of rejection, the Lord just may blind you to the truth. And God's not going to convert an unbeliever any more than he would let Adam eat of the tree of life in his sinful state. You know, they put up that, that put that chair, he put that cherubim in the way of him taking the tree of life so he wouldn't get in there and eat off that tree in his sinful state. And he's not going to let an unbelieving heart be converted any more than he would let Adam eat off that tree of life in his sinful state. So he says, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. You know, they had they just accused him of casting out devils through Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And they they they've hardened their self, just like Pharaoh hardened his heart before God ever hardened his heart. You see, God just didn't harden Pharaoh's heart and, and, and damn him of against his will. You know, Pharaoh hardened his heart many times before the Lord hardened his heart. So, the next thing, you, you go as far as your faith in the Lord. You're going to go as far as your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 16, But blessed are your eyes, talking to the disciples, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. And if you look over at Matthew 16, 16 through 17, It says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You see, Peter believed, and he said, Flesh and blood haven't, hasn't revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. You know, the under, understanding the Scriptures and how great they are, and realizing how great they are, that doesn't come from flesh and blood. That comes from God himself. And you go as far as your faith in him. And the more faith you put in him in the scriptures, the more truth from heaven, the more light from heaven you're going to get. That just regular flesh and blood can't reveal to you. You know, I named off all those pastors and teachers earlier. If it wasn't for God in heaven revealing to me things, 
through them, I wouldn't have got any further on down the road because flesh and blood can't reveal it to me. It has to be God in heaven. You go as far as your faith in him. And he reward. he's going to reward you with more understanding the further along you go with your belief and your faith. You know, some things are hard to understand until you get light on it. Like over in 2 Peter 3.16, Peter talks about how some of the stuff Paul said is, is hard to be understood. And it is, but you got to ask questions. you got to believe what you see and hear. Look for explanations. Keep a soft heart towards the Scriptures. And you go as far as your faith in Him. And you can surpass your teachers. That shouldn't be your motive. But you, you'll end up even surpassing your teachers if you will believe. Like, that shouldn't be your motive. But, you know, a good teacher will teach you everything he knows and then teach you how to surpass him. Because <clears throat> he's given you all that he knew that took him hours and hours and hours to get and then he's given you and given it to you in a shorter time span. That way, you got time to take it further than he took it, if you will believe. I like what David says in Psalm one nineteen ninety nine through a hundred. In Psalm one nineteen ninety nine through a hundred, it says this. It says, "I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation." I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. You you read you read this word and you believe it and you keep it, you're gonna surpass your teachers. And he says in verse 17, For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and not seen them, and hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. You see the Isaiah the prophet wrote a bunch of things that he didn't understand but then the disciples saw the very thing he was writing about and understood it many of the things the disciples didn't understand we understand many things the prophets didn't understand we understand because you know he's he's continuing to reveal truth as time goes along <clears throat> 